So as we resume our study tonight, I want you to think about one of the praise songs that was introduced years ago in the church called Holy Ground, where the song says, we are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. I can remember the first few times I heard that message in song, and thinking about this idea that in a church service, there are invisible guests that as God's people gather, is it true there could be angels that are all around? And as I studied the scripture and I've grown in my understanding of the Bible, I realized there could in fact be instances in which there are angels that that visit worship services because angels do God's bidding and angels have a keen interest in the welfare of God's people. And whether it is angels or even those spirits of darkness, I am convinced that there are times when we are surrounded by both that we may be completely oblivious to. Because, you see, we're used to seeing things with physical eyes, but we are unable to see things that God sees that are happening in the spiritual world. Wouldn't it be amazing if we were able to see where angels are and the times when they are nearby and they are involved in our lives and what we're doing. And wouldn't it also be equally fascinating if we could see with a certain supernatural ability where there are literal demon spirits hovering nearby or who are attached to certain things that are going on. Or maybe when there are things going on in our lives where we're being oppressed where we have the literal ability to see the demon force that may be at work. What I want us to know is whether or not we can see these spirit forces, be they the angels of light or the spirits of darkness, what we need to understand is they are very real and they are at work around us all the time and around the world. And what I want us to think about tonight is what I'm titling the message, Invisible Activity. Invisible Activity. And by that I'm referring specifically to spirit activity. The angels of God and the spirits of darkness. They are all spirits. It's just a matter of which kingdom they, they represent. We know the history of the spirit forces was that all spirits belonged in heaven at one time. But in the rebellion of Satan, Satan and those spirits that were part of his rebellion against the Heavenly Father, they were kicked out and they were banished. And now they are, they've been given the freedom to do certain activities until they'll once and for all be consigned to the lake of fire. So we're talking about... Invisible activity. You said, what does that have to do with Daniel? Well, we're going to see in in the book of Daniel where these spirit forces uh, intersect with Daniel's life and what Daniel was allowed to see. We're going to turn to the 10th chapter in uh, Daniel's prophecy. Before we look in these verses, uh, just to give you a little bit of a summary, verse 1 of this uh, chapter tells us that it was the third year of Cyrus. Well, this is not the third year of his reign. It was the third year after his takeover of Babylon. So what this means is about two years had gone by since he had given the decree to allow the Jewish exiles to to return. And so year one of, of his takeover of Babylon, leading Persia as their king, he gave the decree to let the Jews go back home. And this says it was in his third year of reigning over Babylon as the king of Persia. So that's a little bit of an idea of the timeline there. And out of all the Jews who were exiles, once that decree had been given two years earlier, only 42,000, we believe, returned back to Jerusalem to begin the, the construction project of rebuilding the city from its ruins. And when we read the book of Ezra, Ezra chronicles for us how difficult it was for them to go back and how not long after they return, a sense of despair and complacency set in on the returned exiles. 
maybe this was what broke Daniel's heart. Now in the third year of Cyrus, he's realizing the Jews have had two years back in their homeland to get the foundation laid on the temple that had been destroyed and to start rebuilding. But perhaps he heard about their despondency and their complacency. Whatever the case is, his heart was broken. And we read that he was so broken over the condition of the Jewish people that he entered into a three-week period of fasting and mourning. That tells us how serious he was concerning his love for his fellow Jewish people and for God's plan as a whole. And what we see is that as he began this three-week period of praying and fasting, God heard his cry and heard his prayer. And God sent an angel to comfort him and to give him further revelation. Now, if you remember when we were studying in the ninth chapter, that's exactly what was going on. It was right after Persia had overtaken Babylon. And Daniel had looked in the book of Jeremiah, the, one of the letters Jeremiah had written to the exiles, and he realized, wow, this 70 years is close to being up. What is God going to do with the Jewish people? And as he was crying out in desperation to God, God sent Gabriel to give him that 70-week prophecy back in the ninth chapter. Well, here in the 10th chapter, he's crying out, once again grieved over the future of the Jewish people, and God sends another angel. Now, here's what's interesting. When we read verses 4 through 9, we have one of the most descriptive accounts of an angel in the Bible. And I'm not going to take the time to, to go through it. You can read verses 4 through 9 of chapter 10. But what is very notable about this angel as he's described by Daniel is how remarkably similar this glorious heavenly visitor who comes into Daniel's life, how remarkably similar that angel is to the description that John gives of the exalted Christ in the first chapter of Revelation. And so it is because of the, this remarkable similarity between the angel in Daniel chapter 10 verses 4 through 9 and the glorified Christ in heaven in Revelation chapter 1 that some scholars have assumed this angel in Daniel 10 to be a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus so that more than just a heavenly angel being revealed to Daniel uh, during this three-week time of prayer and fasting perhaps this was a revelation of Jesus to Daniel well we can't say with complete authoritative conclusion that that's the case but it certainly is convincing when you read the comparison between Jesus in Revelation 1 and this angel revealed to Daniel in Daniel chapter 10. Whatever the case, it was so overpowering, the sight of this heavenly visitor, this angel, that Daniel fell to the ground, buried his face in the ground in, in fear. And we read that Daniel was by the Tigris River. Perhaps he was on some official business. And he had uh, some traveling companions with him. And although he tells us that his traveling companions were not able to actually see that angel described in verses 4 through 9. There must have been some type of phenomena surrounding the manifestation of this angel that not only did Daniel bury his face in the ground, but his friends or traveling companions were so afraid they took off and, and ran to hide from this angelic manifestation, even though they couldn't see the details he saw. So now Daniel is all alone. He's very much afraid. That's where we pick up in the 10th verse of Daniel chapter 10, where it says, Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And this, this man, we believe this is another angel. This man said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you. And I want you to stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I, I, I stood. But he says, I might have stood up, but I was still trembling. Then he says in verse 12, the angel says, Do not fear, Daniel. <laughs> Look at this. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And <laughs> The angel says this to Daniel. I have come because of your words. So what I want us to do as we, as we look in those verses is I, I want us to think about 
several things that will go beyond these verses that we just read. But I want us to start, first of all, with the idea of prayer, and that is this. That one of the things this, this account of Daniel getting encouragement from this angel, one of the things it tells us is that God is moved by desperate prayer. God is moved by desperate prayer. When, when we see that he's going through a three-week time, not only of intense prayer, but fasting. I mean, who of us has ever fasted for three weeks just because we were brokenhearted over the plight of God's people and because we had such a burden for God's kingdom in this wicked world. In fact, it wouldn't hurt any of us to fast more, but, but if there's ever been a time when we should consider fasting, it is certainly now. God is moved by desperate prayer. When we read about uh, Daniel and his prayer, his prayers were on behalf of, of the Jewish people. His heart was for God's kingdom plan to prevail. And he was worried at different times that God's plan was not prevailing. And Daniel, we know from other passages prior to this one, he did not want reproach to be brought upon the name of God. And as long as the Jewish people, were, whether it was their captivity in Babylon, or now that uh, you know about 42,000 of them had returned to Jerusalem, and yet they were complacent, they weren't making much progress. Daniel's concern was that God's name would have reproach brought upon it because of the plight of God's covenant people. What this shows is that Daniel wasn't just concerned about his own life. He's in his 80s now. He realizes he's at the end of the road. He wasn't grieving over himself or over his lack of comfort in life. He was grieving because he wanted God's purpose to prevail in the earth. See, when God senses that our heart is aligned with him, he moves quickly to respond to our prayers when we cry out and we lift up petitions that are in accordance with his will. What does God do when he hears prayers from such a heart as that? I want to tell you what he does. He hears. He listens. You see, uh, God is attuned to people whose hearts are attuned to him. And so when, when we think about getting the attention of God, having our heart aligned with him is how we get his attention. You know something else? He not only hears, but he responds. He takes action. When we were reading there in verse number 12, we, we saw it where he said, Do not fear. The angel said, For from the first day that you set your heart to understand. In other words, for the, from the first day that you started praying, and by this time it was three weeks ago, he said, from the first day I was sent to come to you, the moment you started praying and asking God to show you, to help you, when you cried out to God, that moment this angel says, God sent me to you. This is very similar to what Gabriel said in Daniel 9.23 where, where Gabriel said, Daniel, at the beginning of your supplications... The command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. What I want you to know is the, the, the similarity here, whether it is this unnamed angel who says, for from the beginning of your prayer, or it is Gabriel in chapter 9, both of these angels said to Daniel that we were sent by God to you the moment you voiced your first prayer of brokenness and burden for the Jewish people. It, it shows us that God has the ability not only to hear our prayers, but to take swift and decisive action, even sending angels to come to our aid, as he did both Gabriel and this unnamed angel in chapter 10. So he hears, he responds. You know something else God does? God comforts. We know that he comforts us through the Holy Spirit as believers, but in this chapter, where Daniel needs comfort, he uses an angel to comfort Daniel. And in whether it was from the weight of the information that Daniel was receiving or from the awe-inspiring sight of that heavenly angel in verses 4 through 9 that could have been Jesus himself, the angel who is conversing with Daniel, has to comfort him three times. And I've listed on the screen here the three different times. Verse 10, verse 16, verse 18. 
you can just put a check by those three verses because in each of those three verses, the angel brings comfort to, to Daniel. Now, let me just tell you something. You and I have something that Daniel did not have. You and I who are saved, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And although Daniel was saved, no one before the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 had the precious gift of being baptized by the Holy Spirit and indwelt by the Holy Spirit and sealed by the Holy Spirit the way we do. So while we're thankful that God used this angel to comfort Daniel in verse 10, verse 16, verse 18, you and I have an internal source of comfort through the person of the Holy Spirit who has taken up our bodies as his habitation. What an awesome thing. But so he hears, he responds. What does God do when he hears the desperate cry of a heart aligned with his purposes? He strengthens. You know something else this passage tells us that the angel did? Verse number 18, I have it on the screen. It says, then again, one having the likeness of a man touched me and did what? Strengthened me. And he said, O oh, man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, Daniel says, I was strengthened. And I said to this angel, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. What a comfort to know that when we are weak, God can make us strong. And he used an angel to touch and strengthen Daniel. And God can use an angel in your life or my life, but he can also use his spirit, his word. really doesn't matter what God uses, but all of us would bear witness to the fact that there have been times when we knew we were weak and somehow God made us strong because we cried out to him. And in addition, when God hears us crying like Daniel was crying, he reveals things to us. God reveals to those who seek. That's why Jesus said, knock and what? The door will be open. Ask and what? You shall receive. Seek and what? You shall find. So what I want you to, to, to know is this. The book of Daniel is not just about visions and dreams and calendars and timelines and prophecies and beasts and different kinds of horns sprouting from the heads of the beast in these visions and dreams. I want to tell you, don't miss in all the details of the prophecy and the beast and the warrior image. Don't miss this. Daniel is about prayer. Because of all the things you can say about Daniel, what rises to the top is that he was a man of prayer. Every time there is a crisis going on in his life, what does he do? He doesn't turn on the news. He doesn't check his phone. He doesn't see what's on social media. He doesn't call somebody to listen to him, spill his guts. He turns to God. He was a man of prayer. Prayer was his lifeline. Prayer was his habit. And if you remember in the sixth chapter where they passed the law that nobody can pray to any God. And Daniel, what did he do? He went to his apartment. He kept on praying. He says he prayed three times a day down on his knees with the shutters wide open, as was his custom. So prayer was his lifeline, prayer was his habit, prayer was his go-to, and prayer was not, listen, listen, prayer was not only what allowed Daniel to prevail as a captive in Babylon on the earth, but prayer was where Daniel prevailed in heavenly places because as we see in this chapter, Daniel's name was on the lips of angelic beings. He was such a man of prayer that God, in response to Daniel's prayer, sent angels to talk to Daniel, to reveal to Daniel, to comfort Daniel, to strengthen his weary heart and body. And so prayer allowed him to be a mighty man on earth and a mighty man in heavenly places. And I want to say to you tonight, in our time of what seems like exile, where more and more in our country and in our world, it seems like we as Christians are strangers in a foreign land. We need to follow Daniel's example and turn to God in prayer because prayer is what will strengthen us. Prayer is what will give us victory. Prayer is what will summon angels to our defense 
and to the rescue of the cause of righteousness and truth in a dark age. Prayer. <laughs> so what an exciting thing for us to realize tonight that God is moved by desperate prayer. It's time to pray desperately. Here's the second thing, though. Not only is God, by moved, uh, God moved by desperate prayer, <laughs> but I want you to write this down. Angels know that God has a plan for Israel. Angels know that God has a plan for Israel. This first angel to comfort Daniel after this vision of this exalted, glorious angel that might have been Jesus. Um, he says to Daniel in verse 11, I've been sent to you. And I love what he says in verse 11. He says, I want you to try to understand what I'm telling you. <laughs> and I wonder how many times God looks at me, looks at you and says, I need you to try hard to understand what I'm trying to say to you. I need you to try hard to comprehend the message that you need to hear from me. I know as a pastor, our pastor often says, don't miss this, watch this, listen, write this down. It's the burden of prophetic truth. And, and, and I want you to know, as this angel says in verse 11, please try to understand. Um, one of the greatest tragedies must be in the heart of God. When God does everything within his power, to impart spiritual truth, but we do not receive it. It's certainly heartbreaking to a pastor or to a preacher to be sharing a message before people who seem so indifferent. And by the way, I, I've been blessed to serve in churches where that's not been the case, where God's always allowed me to serve in churches where people affirm the truth or hungry for more, and they say amen, they love the Word of God there are many people who aren't interested in understanding. And this angel says to Daniel, try hard to understand. In verse 12, he says, do not fear. Your prayer was heard. And from the first day you started praying, I was sent to come to you. And this angel says, I have a purpose for coming to you. I mean, just think about this. The angel said, God sent me from the moment you started praying. And I have a purpose for which I was sent. To comfort you? Yes, I'll do that. To strengthen you, yes, I'll do that. But do you know what the greatest purpose for which God sent this angel to, to speak to Daniel? I mean, what was Daniel praying about? Same thing he was praying about in the ninth chapter. The future of the people of Israel. And in verse number 14, this is what the angel said. The angel said, now I have come to make you understand. And look what's underlined there. What will happen to your people in the latter days? For the vision refers to many days yet to come. So you see there, the angel says, the greatest purpose for which I was sent to you is to tell you what will happen to your people in the latter days. Who are Daniel's people? They're the Jewish people. We know the latter days has a dual fulfillment. We've talked about dual fulfillment a lot in our Daniel study. One would be in the, the latter days, which would be just before Israel was wiped out by the Romans after the crucifixion of Jesus in 70 AD. There's a sense in which that was the, the, the latter days. But the, but the ultimate fulfillment of the latter days for the Jewish people will be when Israel is in the last half of the tribulation when the whole world turns against Israel under the leadership of the Antichrist and then Israel is rescued by Jesus' return. So the first coming of Jesus is part of the latter days of Israel, but the ultimate fulfillment of the latter days of Israel is the second coming of Christ. It's interesting. The latter days of Israel whether it is preliminary or final, have to do with the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. The point that I'm bringing to your attention is this. The angel says, I've come to talk to you about the latter days of Israel. And he says in, in the last part of verse 14, it is for uh, the, the, the vision refers to many days yet to come. If you go back into the first verse, we didn't read the first verse, but I want you to put it on the screen from chapter 10. 
In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. If you'll remember, that was the name given to him when he moved, when he was uh, transported into Babylon. The message was true, but look at what's underlined. Daniel says, the appointed time was long. Did you see that? The appointed time was long. So I want you to think about that phrase, the appointed time was long. And, and then look back in verse 14 that we read where it says the vision refers to many days yet to come. It's because those two are hand in hand. What this tells us is this. If the whole purpose for this unnamed angel coming to speak to Daniel was to speak to him about the latter times for the Jewish people. And verse number one says there is an appointed time. It tells us that just like there is a 70-week timeline, which is 490 years, that the timeline for Israel is an appointed time. This angel revealed to something that Daniel writes in verse 1, just as Gabriel spoke to Daniel in chapter 9, the same terminology, 70 weeks are appointed for your people, chapter 10 there is an appointed time for your people. It means there is an appointed timeline on God's calendar for the Jewish people. And it tells us there in verse number 1 of chapter 10, it's a long time. A long time. So it means that Israel is going to be in the picture for the long haul. It's not just going to be that within a few hundred years Israel's done. Christ comes, the church takes Israel's place. Oh no, the long time refers to a much longer time than just when Jesus came the first time. There is still prophecy that Israel must fulfill and must be fulfilled on Israel's behalf. And all of this is going to culminate in the last days about which Jesus had so much to say. So, so what, what am I saying about this? The angel said, Yes, I came to comfort you. Yes, I came to strengthen you. Yes, I came to give you hope. But I primarily came in answer to your cry to talk about the future of Israel. So what I want to say to you tonight is this. If, if the angels were talking about this back in Daniel's day, and if God sent the angel, Gabriel in chapter 9, and this unnamed angel in chapter 10, if God sent the angel to talk to Daniel about Israel it proves that God has a plan for Israel. And if God knows this and if angels know this, how come so many Christians don't know this? How, many, so, how come so many Christians are oblivious to this? What I want every one of you to understand is, although I'm not the best teacher you could have heard present the book of Daniel to you, there are many, that's why we've been giving away these books, because the people who've read these books have done a far better job than I can do in, in 20 different attempts. But for those of you who've, who've suffered through <laughs> the frailty of the messenger and who've really tried to grapple with these concepts, you will have etched into your heart and soul and mind from now until you die, until Jesus comes back, that God is not finished with the Jewish people. Your heart will be drawn back to Daniel. Your spirit will hearken back to the 70-week prophecy and to what we're going to see in this chapter and the last two chapters, 11 and 12, to realize that the signs of the times will revolve around Israel for the last days, and those who've either rejected the truth or who have no interest in knowing the truth, are going to miss it as it plays out. But you won't miss it because you know and you've been enlightened and God has shown you. And that's one of the greatest reasons for which the book of Daniel is so valuable. First of all, you can't make any sense out of New Testament prophecy without Daniel. <laughs> and secondly, we will, you, you couldn't make sense about the days in which we live and the direction in which our world is heading had we not delved into Daniel and mined out the spiritual truths and insights that are revealed therein. So what I'm saying to you is that the angels know there's a future plan for Israel. And if the angels get it, then surely they're interested in us knowing about it. And God help the people, especially the Christians and these pastors who don't even have an interest in Israel or God's plan 
for the last days and how the coming of Christ interfaces with the existence of Israel. Okay, here's something else I want you to write down. Not only that God is moved by desperate, heartfelt, urgent prayer. Not only that, but that angels know there's a plan for Israel. The third thing I want you to write down is that for everything we can see, there is more we cannot see. For everything we can see, there is more that we cannot see. As human beings, we're physical beings, material beings, and we, we, we live in a material world, material planet, material universe. And it's our nature, it's our logical reasoning that lets us draw conclusions based on things we see and hear and feel and experience. But this passage teaches us that there is spiritual activity that we cannot see with our physical eyes. We cannot hear with our literal ears. We cannot necessarily feel or experience, but it's nonetheless real. This spiritual activity is all around us in the world. And, and, and not only this, it's above us in the skies and the atmosphere. And it is in the heavenly realm beyond the universe. So don't misunderstand it. There's spiritual activity in the world. There's spiritual activity in the skies and the atmosphere and the universe. And there is spiritual activity in the heavenly place beyond the physical universe. It gets very interesting. So I want you to stop and think with me about this. This unnamed angel who starts talking to, to Daniel, he says, from the time you started praying, I was sent to come to you. But he says he was delayed. <laughs> Daniel probably wanted to say, well, if you were sent three weeks ago when I started this fast and this prayer time, when I first began to do this, if you were sent three weeks ago, what took you so long? Well, he says in verse 13, he says, the reason it took me three weeks to get to you is because the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, I, I just want to say to you, this is one of the most fascinating insights that we have into the activity of angels recorded for us in the Bible. Because this, this angel says, God sent me three weeks ago, but I got stuck in a fight with someone who is called the Prince of Persia. That is not talking about a human being, that is talking about a demonic spirit who is referred to as a prince, which means a ruler, which tells us that this angel from heaven got into a tangle with a demonic spirit who had been assigned by Satan over the Persian kingdom. And this demonic spirit had kept this heavenly angel from getting to Daniel. Now, you, just, you, need, you need to think about that and what all this means. Well, what I'd like for us to do is, is as we see the conversation between this heavenly angel and Daniel, and this heavenly angel saying, I've been tied up with a demon spirit that kept me from getting to you because somehow this demon spirit stands watch over Persia. And, and he, did you see it when we read verse 13? He says, if Michael, one of the chief princes, had not come to help me in this fight, I couldn't have gotten to you when I did. So what I want to do is I just want to list what I'm calling insights into the spiritual world. You ready for it? And we're just going to make a list of these things. And the first one is this. There is spiritual conflict between angels and demons. Write that down. There is spiritual conflict between angels and demons. And, and demons. How do we know that? Because this angel says, I've been trying for three weeks, 21 days to get to you. Isn't that interesting? That a demon spirit had prevented a heavenly angel from getting to Daniel. Here's the second thing I want you to write down. Demon spirits have power to withstand angels. Obviously, that's what this angel tells us in verse number 13. The prince of Persia withstood me. It was so intense that it caused a three-week delay. Wouldn't you think that an angel from God could triumph over a demon spirit? Well, this angel says that Michael, 
one of the chief angels had to come to the aid of this angel who'd been given the mission from God to come to Daniel and comfort Daniel and give Daniel further revelation. So it tells us that there's conflict between angels and demons. And it also tells us that for some reason in God's plan, he has allowed demon spirits to have the ability to withstand heavenly angels. Very interesting. But what I want us to remember is this. Whether there is conflict or whether demon spirits can withstand angelic spirits, Here's what we know is that angels are dispatched by God when they go somewhere. This angel says, from the moment you began praying, I was sent to you. Same thing Gabriel said to Daniel in the ninth chapter. So if the angels are sent, who does the sending? God does the sending because angels are dispatched by God. In other words, God summons the angels and tells them where to go and what to do. This is why the writer of Psalm 91 in verse 11 says, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. That verse is a promise that says God gives the charge to angels. God assigns the angels where they go, what they do, and to whom they they minister or attack, as the case may be. Here's something else I want you to write down. Angels are God's ministering spirits. Heavenly angels we're talking about are God's ministering spirits. In this passage where this angel in chapter 10 of Daniel is comforting and strengthening Daniel and and will go on to reveal further insights in the next two chapters, um, what it proves to us is that God uses angels to minister to his children. For instance, uh, you know, some of the best places to see this happen are in the life of Jesus. You remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness after he'd been fasting for 40 days? And it was a, it, you know, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a summary report Matthew gives us of just the three temptations and the three scriptures that Jesus quoted back. But it, it, it had to have been an agonizing encounter, the Son of God with the Prince of Darkness out in the wilderness just as he's beginning his earthly ministry. And at the conclusion of that battle of temptation between, between Christ and Satan himself, Matthew records for us in chapter 4 and verse 11, it says, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to Jesus. <laughs> God the Father sent the angels to minister to the incarnate Jesus Christ after this wearying conflict with his own hunger from fasting and the spiritual battle with Satan during these temptation encounters. God sent angels to lift up Jesus. Not only this, but you may remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was starting to feel the anticipation of the blows of the, of, of the, of the nail, but most of all of the abandonment of the Father who would unleash his wrath that we deserved upon Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, verse 41, it says that Jesus was withdrawn from his disciples about a stone's throw there in Gethsemane, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then Luke tells us, then an angel appeared to Jesus from heaven, strengthening him. Let me ask you a question. Who sent the angel from heaven to Gethsemane to strengthen a weary Lord Jesus? His heavenly Father did. You say, well, that's that's what God does. He sends an angel to Jesus. He he sent an angel to comfort and strengthen uh, Daniel. but, But I'm just an old common everyday sinner saved by grace. Why would God dispatch an angel to, to encourage, to strengthen, to bless me. Well, the writer of Hebrews, when he was contrasting angels with Jesus and how Jesus is superior to the angels, he still gives us an insight into angels in chapter 1, verse 13, where he says, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand? 
till I make your enemies your footstool. The writer there is saying that God only said that to Jesus. However, he says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So even though the writer there is contrasting the superiority of Jesus with angels, meaning by that, don't worship angels, don't pray to angels, worship Jesus, pray to Jesus. Nevertheless, don't discount the fact that angels are, and he calls them, verse 14, ministering spirits. They are heavenly spirits sent to serve those and bless those who will inherit salvation. My point is this. <laughs> we're not Jesus. Of course we're not. And we're not Daniel. And who of us would put ourselves in the same category as either the Son of God or Daniel the prophet? But I will tell you what we are if we're saved. We are those who stand destined to inherit salvation because we have been marked with the blood covenant of Christ. And the Bible says that God uses angels to be his ministering spirits to channel blessings to us, to deliver blessings to us, to contend for us, to defend against dark spirits on our behalf because all of us who are saved, we are God's children and we are heirs of salvation and God dispatches angels to serve us. Glory to God in the highest. <laughs> And maybe one day, when we're all in heaven, God's going to sit each one of us down and he's going to have it on a DVR. All the times when angels were dispatched to our aid and because they are invisible, we could not see them. And maybe he's going to let us sit down and watch all the times angels were intervening at his command on our behalf. But I want to say something else to you. Write this down. Spirits have specific assignments. They have specific assignments. And, and I want to start with demon spirits. We looked at this in verse 13 where the angel said, this prince of Persia, that's a demon spirit that apparently had been assigned to the nation or the dominion of Persia. But what I want us to do also is to look in verse 20. Where this angel says, do you know why I've come to you, Daniel? And he says, now i got to go back and fight with the prince of Persia. In other words, i got to put the gloves back on and go fight with this de demon spirit over Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. There's another reference to a demon spirit who had apparently been assigned jurisdiction over Greece which would be the empire that would overtake Persia one day. Now, this is amazing to me to see a reference to the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, and to realize that these are demon spirits that contend with heavenly angels. And it lets us know that there are demons that have been given geographical jurisdiction in certain parts of the world. When we fast forward into the time of the tribulation period in the book of Revelation, there is a set of judgments called the trumpet judgments. And in Revelation 9, 13, it says, The six angels sounded, and John says, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, this, listen, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. These are fallen angels. Verse 15. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Here's what I want to ask you. If there were these four spirits confined at the river Euphrates who are, un, uh, who are released at some point, some climactic point of the tribulation to, to go out and administer death to a third of existing mankind at that time? And if there's a prince of Greece that this angel talking to Daniel says, I'm going to contend with, and a prince of Persia, um, do you not realize that there is a biblical premise for this idea that demon spirits can be assigned to cities? Demon spirits can be assigned by Satan and, and, and given uh, 
the freedom by God to take that dominion over territories, over nations, over parts of the world. We don't know where those are. Sometimes I believe that God can give us a, a sense of discernment where there is spiritual activity, where there is spiritual strongholds. But it's what I, I can't explain all of this to you. I, I can't tell you how, how to have the radar to detect where, where demon forces are. But do not tell me for one moment that the kinds of things we see happening in some of the cities of our country, do not tell me that those things do not have direct bearing on demons that have been assigned to those cities. demons that have taken over jurisdiction. Maybe they didn't always have it. But listen, I was thinking about this today when in Romans chapter 1 it says, when people who know the truth reject it time and time and time again, it says God will give them over. I happen to believe that included in God giving people over to reprobation could be God giving over cities, God giving over country, God even giving over churches so that the spiritual angelic heavenly forces that protect and defend that city or that family or that country or that church or that neighborhood, whatever it might be, that God can give a heavenly angel permission to abandon his post and give that place over to angels of darkness, giving them over. That is one of the tragedies when God gives a nation over, a, a city over, when God lets go and allows demon forces like the prince of Persia, like the prince of Greece, like the four angels bound at the river Euphrates that will be released during the tribulation. When God lets go and gives dominion to darkness over certain areas, it, it ought to get our attention. So what kind of demons have been assigned to the city where we live? To the state, to the nation, to other places of power around the world. But I want us to talk about angels for a moment because the angel in this passage is a messenger who travels on a specific assignment, gets thwarted by demonic interference by the prince of Persia, and says Michael came and, and helped. <laughs> so we've got an unnamed angel talking to Daniel who mentions Michael by name. Who in the world is Michael? Michael, we believe, is the most powerful of all the angelic host of heaven. Not only that, but Michael is the guardian angel of Israel. Write it down. He's the guardian angel of Israel. When we fast forward in this chapter to verse number 21, this angel says, I'm going to tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. And then parenthetically, no one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. You see that? Why is Michael your prince? He's talked about the prince of Persia, prince of Greece, which means a ruling angel. But when he's speaking to Daniel about Daniel and the future of the Jewish people, the people of Israel, he calls Michael their prince. Ha! Michael is the guardian angel over Israel. And in chapter 12, we're going to get to it, but in verse number 1, it says, At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince or angel who stands watch over the sons of your people. Who are the sons of your people? The Jewish people. Michael is the guardian prince in heavenly places who has been assigned by God as the chief of all angels to take care of and watch over and fulfill God's plan in the life of the Jewish people. In the little one chapter letter of Jude, verse 9, Jude tells us, Michael the archangel, when he was contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but Michael said to the devil, the Lord rebuke you. We don't even know. There's no passage in the Old Testament that refers to that, but Jude, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that Michael the archangel and prince of Israel contended with the devil about the body of Moses, the bones of Moses. Conflict, guardian of Israel. And then in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, it says, During this time in the tribulation, we believe this is in the last half of the tribulation, 
War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. The dragon is, the, is Satan. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So there you see that in the, in the last part of the tribulation, that Michael, the guardian of Israel, will fight with the dragon who is Satan. So let me ask you a question. If God's finished with Israel and Revelation is about the last days before the return of Christ, then why would Michael, the, the, the guardian angel of Israel, be contending with Satan? It's because Israel will play a part in the last days. Well, here's the last thing I want you to write down under these insights into spiritual activity. And that is this. There is a heavenly realm where spiritual battles are fought. So all the stuff I've been talking about is it's invisible to our human eyes. So when, when we think about spirits, angels, demons, heavenly spirits, demonic spirits, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of hell, when we think about these spirits in conflict, here are some of the kinds of questions that, that we should ask. Like, just out of curiosity, where if, if, if angels and demons fight, like he said, Daniel, I started coming from heaven to you, God sent me, but for three weeks I got held up on the border <laughs> by the demon who is the prince over Persia. Where did this take place? Where do these uh, spiritual conflicts between angels and demons take place? And let me ask you another question. You know, out of curiosity, I would ask, if these spirits do not have material bodies, because spirits obviously are spirits, how do they fight if they don't have material fists that can collide, their spirits, how do they fight? What, what weapons do they use? And how is it that victory is won? For instance, when the angel says, for three weeks I was fighting at the border with the prince of Persia, and Michael came. Michael hadn't come, I wouldn't have gotten to you when I did. Well, what did Michael do? to triumph and to help that angel prevail over the angel of Persia who was resisting him and hindering him. Well, I, I, I don't know, but, but here's, here's what I can tell you. We've got a wonderful verse in the New Testament that gives us some insight, and then I'll have prayer. It's Ephesians 6 and verse 12. And Paul, this is at the conclusion of the whole, put on the whole armor of God, you know, he says here, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. What Paul wants Christians to know is the real battle we have is not with human beings. That's flesh and blood people. But our real battle, the real conflict is against rulers, powers, and world forces of darkness. Look at, I'm going to read that again. Rulers, powers, and the world forces of darkness spiritual forces of wickedness, where? In the heavenly places. So this is a wonderful companion verse, Ephesians 6, 12, to go along with what we see here in Daniel chapter 10. That as humans, our real enemies and opponents are not the people we can see but the real conflict is invisible. And according to that breakdown of rulers, powers, world forces of darkness, this tells us that demon spirits have been organized. They, they, they have rankings. They have territorial assignments. Some are confined to certain areas. Some can roam. But they are all under the command of the, of the archangel of darkness, Satan, who used to be the angel of light, but fell. And now is forever the angel of darkness who oversees his different classifications and rankings of minions. And what Ephesians 6.12 tells us is that the greatest conflicts... Did you see the last part of that verse? Are in the heavenly places. Which can be in the skies above us. Perhaps the conflict between the angel that came to Daniel and the prince of Persia was in the atmosphere over the geographical region where Daniel lived 
in what was Babylon that is now considered part of Persia. Maybe the heavenly places is not just the atmosphere within earth, but could be in outer space. I believe specifically heavenly places is beyond the universe in some type of realm where God is, not where all the redeemed are already with Jesus, but in an outer place of heaven where the demons and angels are allowed to combat one another. And here's a question that I want to ask you before we pray. If this angel said to Daniel, Daniel, my coming to you was in response to your prayer. And Daniel tells us he'd been praying and fasting for three weeks. Could it be that Daniel's prayer had a part in summoning Michael to help the heavenly angel prevail over the prince of Persia. In other words, could it be that when Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but we Christians, not angels, we Christians, we are in a spiritual fight with demon forces. Could it be that our prayers play a part in defeating demon forces? in causing demon spirits to retreat? Could it be that our prayers play a part in empowering heavenly angels to prevail over demonic spirits in heavenly places? I just happen to believe that there is something so powerful about the prayers of blood-bought, spirit-sealed children of God that gives victory to heavenly angels and bids defeat to demonic spirits. Well, this was heavy. This was heavy for, for me to be, have the first sermon coming off of my vacation. But, oh, I'm telling you, it's, it helps me to realize that, that all that is going on in our day and time is not just what we see with these eyes. It's perhaps what we cannot see with physical eyes that is most important. Father, we thank you that ours is the victory through Jesus Christ. And we thank you that if angels have to contend with demon spirits, we know we will as well. But teach us that whether all of this is comprehensible to us or not, that the key to our victory is to be men and women of prayer like Daniel of old. In Jesus' name, amen.